Just praying that God will come by his spirit and speak to each and every one of us. That's what we need. That's what we're here for. We're here to hear from God, to listen to him, uh, to worship Jesus, to remember Jesus and to hear from God speaking into our lives, changing us and helping us as we go on this journey. Uh, we've got an historical account this morning. If you've got a Bible, it's an historical event. Uh, go to Genesis chapter 11, please, and we'll kick off there in a moment. But we've got an historical account of the journey of Abraham and how it began. And we're going to break in at verse 27 in a moment. So it's Genesis 11 and verse 27. Abram, A-B-R-A-M, later named Abraham, God changes his name, God gives us all a new identity in Christ. When we come to God, when we come to be a friend of God like Abraham was, the Bible calls Abraham a friend of God, God's friend. He wasn't always God's friend, but he became God's friend by faith. And when you become God's friend, God gives you a new identity. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation, an entirely new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things become new, says the Bible. You've got a new name in Christ. You're a new person in him. So it's Abraham, later becomes Abraham. And from this historical event, it's the beginning of his journey. Talks about his father, Terah. We're going to read about him in a moment. Talks about his family background, about the location where we meet him. Where did he start his journey? God chooses Abraham for a particular task. God steps into this man's life and says, he puts his hand on him and he chooses him, he elects him for a task. Strictly speaking, his election here by God is for service. He's putting his hand on a man and says, I'm going to use you. I have a task for you to accomplish. Not for election, for not an election of salvation as such. People will say, you know, God chooses some people. He elects them. He puts his hand on them like that and he damns other people. He puts his hand on other humans made in the image of God and he damns them. That's not true. Abraham here is elected for a task, for a mission, for service. Later on, Abraham does get saved. But how does he get saved? He gets saved like the rest of us get saved. He, and, and, the, and the New Testament picks this up and he gets saved by faith. Abraham believed God and the Lord accredited to him as righteousness. That's how everyone gets saved. That God makes promises to us all and it's open for each and every one of us to freely come and, and follow God and believe God or not. That's how we get saved. That's how we become elect. Abraham believed God. If you believe God, you'll become part of the elect. If you don't believe God, you'll remain outside the elect. Abraham's an individual and he becomes eventually a nation under God. God's going to use him and, and, and work through this man and through this man's family. And through Abraham, eventually comes Jesus the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Through this man's seed comes the Savior. And all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through what God's going to do with Abraham. Eventually and primarily through Jesus. So Abraham, when we meet him... The, there's other places in the scriptures, we're not going to go there, but scripture fills in some of the blanks that aren't in Genesis. And Abraham is an idolater. He's, he belongs to a family of idolaters in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. Uh, in this place, it's full of idolatry. Abraham and his family were located in Ur of the Chaldeans in modern day Iraq. That's where we find them. It's a center of moon worship in particular. And there's a God who's primary over all the other idols in the land. And it's the God called Sin. That's his name. Sin, the moon God. And these guys were into worshiping this moon idol. And his family would have been into this. It was a dark place when we meet Abraham and his family. And God began to speak to this man. And God makes this man promises, which he repeats to his son, Isaac. As you read through the story, Abraham has a son called Isaac, and then Isaac has a son called Jacob, and God repeatedly deals with this man's seed, this man's family, and he, he makes the same promises that he made to Abraham, because God's faithful, and he doesn't break his promises, and he makes the same promises to Isaac. Make sure Isaac's in the picture. Make sure Isaac knows what's going on. And Jacob, 
And eventually then to the nation that comes out of Jacob into the book of Exodus and God steps in again and calls Moses and so on and the story continues. But here's where you could say the story begins. But God began to speak to a man. And God sets Abraham on a journey. And he, bring, he begins to bring him to a land that he's going to give him and his descendants. And he makes some promises. And so Abraham's going somewhere. That's what I want to get at before we read our text. When God steps into your life, a journey begins. When Jesus comes into your life, he says, follow me. That's what he says. Follow me. So a journey begins. That's what we are as Christians. We're on a journey with Jesus. So Abraham's going somewhere with God. He has a destination. God's taking him somewhere. God essentially says, follow me. Come to the land that I'm going to show you. And it's time now, you see, to leave the false idols behind and his moon god behind and all the idols of this past life. And it's time to begin a new journey with God, worshipping and serving the true God. Because only the true God can really speak anyway. This is the God speaking into his life. And yet the text tells us, as we're going to read, that he and his father, Terah, settled at the halfway point. That's the big thing to get into your head. There's a journey begins, and then there's a journey that stops. That's what God wants to put his finger on this morning, in my life and in your life, through these, the, men, the lives of these men here. That's what he wants to put his finger on. The text tells us that Terah settled at the halfway point in Haran. It's the wrong place. It's not the final destination, but they settle here in Haran, about 600 miles from where they set out, they settled down. Let's read Genesis 11 just to see what we're talking about. Verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now that's not the place Haran, that's the person, the son Haran. There's two names going on here. And Haran fathered Lot. So Lot is Abraham's nephew. We meet Lot later on in the story too. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And verse 29, Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishka. Verse 30, now Sarai was barren. She had no child. That's an alert being put into the text here. This is a problem. She's barren, there's no child. And then God later on says, through your seed I'm going to bless the world to Abraham. And Abraham's thinking, how's that going to happen? And this is the start of the problem being raised in the text. Later on you see it worked out fully. Verse 31, Terah took Abraham his son and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. See that? The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. That's where he died. That's, he settled in this place, and he died in this place. And that's what the Lord really, it's a simple message. He just wants to take this out and think about it. So what we have here is an historical event, but it's also an important spiritual lesson. This thing happened in history, but it's, got, it's an historical event, but it's got spiritual lessons for us this morning. We have a journey begun. We have a living God leading the way. Okay? We have a walk with God that started and then abandoned. Or at least, if it's not abandoned, it's severely disrupted. It's severely delayed. They settled in Haran. We have a halfway house experience in Haran. Does anyone in their own Christian experience understand being in the halfway house? You're going so far with God. Maybe one time you're on fire for God, for Jesus. And then you go lukewarm and you go cold and I might go to church and I might not and I might do this and I might not and I might read my Bible and I might not. The halfway house. That's what God's dealing with this morning. They settled in Haran, says the text. Have you settled in Haran? The word literally here for settled actually means to sit down, to dwell. I'm going no further. I'm going to dwell in this place. I'm going to sit down now. I've started the journey, but now I don't fancy it. I'm going to just sit down. There's something about this place that I find appealing or I like. 
I'm going to sit down. They dwelt in Haran. They began to set up home in this place. They stopped moving on. The journey ceased. They sat down. God says, let's move. And at first they say, fine, let's go. They gather up the people. And then somewhere on the journey at a place called Haran, they said, no further. That's what's happening. And they sat down. Spiritually speaking, we can all sit down. We can stop going on with God. Do you see what's happening to Terah and his family historically? Do you see what's happening here historically? They've started the journey and they've sat down at the midway point. And do you see the danger for you and I spiritually in that story? We can all experience, you see, Haran moments in our journey with Jesus. Moments of delay. Moments of nothing happening. Moments of our progress is non-existent, it seems. Are we going forward at all, we think? Is God with me at all? What's going on? It can be a Haran experience. Maybe it's through circumstances that you didn't bring into your life, but they're in your life. Or maybe it's through your own negligence. Who knows what's going on in these moments, but they're there. I understand it. I've been in Haran moments all the time. Sometimes you just have to get on your face and say, God, help. Help. Where's the progress? Why did they stop going on with God? I want to ask this question as we move through. Why did they lay? What was going on in, in this situation? Why the lack of progress? Why did they sit down? That's what I want to ask. Why did they sit down? Well, when you read the commentaries, it seems that the old life was getting back in again. They had left an old life behind. They had decided to move on with God. But then it seems possible, the commentators say here, that the reason why, it's not in the text, it's a speculation. And what isn't given by revelation is speculation. But sometimes it's good to speculate. Sometimes it's good to think it through and listen to what people have thought about it. The old life they left behind wasn't fully left behind. What do you mean, Mark? Surely they've set out and they've gone on the journey. It's surely it's behind them. Well, the old idols, the old moon gods from the past, you see, they were present here in a big way. This was another center. Haran, just like Ur of the Chaldeans, was another center of, of worship of this particular moon god. And the commentators are wondering and they're scratching their heads and they're going, I wonder that the old idols stopped the progress. I wonder that old Terra. Was it too hard from the leave, the pass behind fully? This is something similar to what we had at home. This is something similar to what we were doing there. Haran was another center of moon worship. The archaeologists tell us that. The old familiar way of life was once again on offer. Let me say that again. The old familiar way of life pops up again in the future and it's again on offer to you. What you left behind is right here in front of you again. That's what the enemy does. Whether this is speculation and right or wrong or not, this is true anyway spiritually. This is what the enemy does. The old things you leave behind pop up again on your journey and try to stop you in your tracks. Sit down here, says sin. Sit down here, says Satan. The world says sit here and go no further with this Jesus stuff. That's what's happening. The old life comes knocking on the door. The old idols make an appearance. The old sins from the past seek your attention and your love and your devotion once again. And when you're loving idols and being devoted to other things, you're not loving Jesus and being devoted to his things. It's simple. And that's a tactic of Satan. We're in danger of halting our progress with Jesus when these things get in. The past will come knocking again. The past sins will come knocking again. We can't expect Satan to say, I got him or I got her once with that sin, but now he's with Jesus and that sin won't work anymore. That's not how it works. Satan thinks like this. That sin got her in the past. That sin could be effective in the future. Let's find out. The devil's like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And we can settle down and we can sit down in the wrong place. And we begin to, we begin to dwell in our old life. That's what happens. Is that what's happening here? Historically, it can happen here spiritually in our lives. We can begin to settle down, sit down and dwell in this place of the past. The old life creeps in again. 
Spiritual advance can stop. And God wants you advancing. What's this preacher on about? Uh, these words, progress and advance and abound and all of this here. Well, that's what God wants for you. God wants you to progress. God wants you to make advance. God wants you to keep pressing on and pressing in and taking ground. That's what God wants. That's a good thing. But these things want you to sit down. What historically happened to Tara must not spiritually happen to me and you. And it can do. And it's a struggle. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And there's a spiritual war on and we better be in the fight. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, he puts it like this, that we Christians, we have turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So Paul's saying, do you know what the definition of a Christian is? It's someone who has turned to God. They've started a journey. You're walking God's way. It's called repentance. A Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and that's it and also we're waiting for Jesus from heaven who saves us from the wrath to come that's the definition of a Christian and Satan says let me test that out and oh he's saying and she's saying that she's turned to God from idols but let me just put an idol or two back in front of this woman and see what happens that's Satan's tactic let's bring the old life back into the present we're always in danger, you see, I've wrote it down here like this. We're always in danger of doing a Terah. Terah was Abraham's father. We're always in danger of doing a Terah. What do I mean? Doing what he did. We're always battling against settling. Battling against settling in Haran. That's the battle. And we have to constantly battle against allowing our old self, our old life, our old, old idols, our old attitudes to creep in and dominate the whole journey. I can easily forget I claim to follow Jesus. When I wake up in the morning, I'm a follower of Jesus. I do life Jesus' way. I can forget that. Can you? When you put your foot out of bed, when you go to work, you're a Jesus follower. The old life's gone. The new has come. When we go to the shop, you're a Jesus follower there. You're an ambassador of Christ. How easy it is just to get up and think, nothing's changed, it's just the same old me. Maybe I'll speak to Jesus or read a bit of the Bible later, but in the meantime, my life's my own. My journey's my own. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we're to be led by the Spirit, and we're to be Jesus followers. Jesus ambassadors. Jesus people. We belong to him. The Bible says you're not your own, you're bought at a price. You don't even belong to you. That's, that's, that's an amazing thing. I remember the first time I heard that, that truth. I don't belong to me. I don't own my body. I don't own my mind. I don't own me. The Bible says, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. You belong to Jesus. You're bought by his blood. That's an amazing truth. So the sad line in all of us as we press on through is, is in verse 32 where it says, this is, a, this is a killer of a line really, isn't it? Terah died in Haran. That's where he died. He died, stopped. He wasn't flat out for God. He died in Haran. That's a sad verse there. It's a sad end. Terah died in Haran. Terah died settled. He died settled. He died not taking progress. He died not on the journey. He died just where he wanted to be, doing his thing. Not making progress. He died in the halfway house. And I feel that the, the Lord wants to say to us all this morning, Christian, whatever you do, don't die in Haran. Don't die in the halfway house. Don't die half committed, half hearted, half baked in the halfway house. Don't do that. And God's encouraging us. This isn't a hard word this morning. This is an encouraging word. I feel that God really wants to encourage us this morning. This is a word that will bring life to you. And I fear many believers die in Haran and, and they don't need to die in Haran. There's no need to die in this halfway house. God has given us enough to bring us right through on fire. To bring us right through flat out for Jesus. And I fear many believers die in this Haran experience like Terah. It's not that they're not saved. It's not that they're not saved. Once you repent and put your faith in Jesus, you're in the battle, but you're saved. 
But the battle can be fierce. And I see so many, and including myself, I've been through this journey quite a while now, and I know the ups and downs. I know it. I'm with you on this. And I, but I fear many believers do die in Haran, like Terah. Not that they were not saved, but that they were not advanced. And that's what I'm trying to get to. Christians who die, they're not in this uh, halfway house, just going through the motions with Jesus. It's not that they're not saved, it's that they're not advancing. They're not on the journey. That's the danger. That's what the Lord wants to, to say to you this morning and, and encourage you about. Not truly taking ground spiritually. Not daily leaving the old self behind and the old life behind. And Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you pick up your cross daily. It's a daily crucifixion. It's a daily death to the old life, the old you, the old attitudes, and I'm guilty. How many times have I got up and left the, cru the crucifix or the cross at the side of the bed? Many times. But I'm asking God to help me pick it up because I want to be a disciple. I want to be the real deal. I want to follow Jesus. I want to be changed. I want his help. But this is the danger. Many Christians don't continue to take ground and they never see what God had planned for their lives up ahead. And this is the exciting part. You know, Christian, God has plans for you up ahead. I don't know what they are. But the Holy Spirit's in you and he wants to use you. I know that. I know that for certain. That God, when you got saved, he put his Holy Spirit in you to work through you to the benefit and upbuilding of other people and to help you on your journey and to transform you by the power of God. That's his plans for you. His plan isn't that you sit in the halfway house, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, lukewarm, couldn't care less. I'm saved by the skin of my teeth. Saved by the skin of your teeth isn't where Jesus wants you to be. We all have potential in Christ to be used by God in powerful ways, in eternal ways. Every single one of you has a spiritual gift. Everyone, every child of God has a gift from God, a spiritual gift, and God wants you to stir it up and use it. And because of these Haran experiences, many never get to become, this is what I wrote down, many Christians never get to become the type of a Christ-like person they could become on this earth because they settle in Haran and they die there. Christ-likeness, holiness, power, Fruit, advance, progress. These are the great exciting words of the gospel. This is what God wants to do in your life, brother, sister. And many never get to see this amazing thing called Christ-likeness develop in our lives. Because we're settled in Haran and we're going to die there. Unless the Lord steps in. I wrote down here, and I put myself in this category. We're all in the same boat, guys. There's nothing special about a pastor. There's nothing special about, about anyone who would open the Bible and preach like us. I'm a sinner being saved by grace. Saved in the past, being saved in the present, and I will be saved in the future. But we struggle all with these things. Christ-likeness never truly ripens in some people's lives. You see, when you get saved, God's aim is to conform you to the image of Jesus. What's he saying? He's saying, I want to make you like my son. I want to restore the image of God in you that was lost in the garden. It was fractured, it was broken, it was distorted by sin. The image of God is distorted in, in every human. When that human gets saved, God begins a transforming work of renewing in you the image of God, making you more like God than you were when you got saved. Making you more like Jesus next week than you were last week next year than you were last year. Do you get it? It's a journey towards Christ-likeness. And many people, I wrote this down, their tree of personal holiness never reaches full bloom. If holiness is like a tree in full bloom, many people's trees never reach full bloom. Personal holiness never gets there. The buds start, they start to appear, but the apples never ripen. You're saved, all right. The buds are there. The potential's there. The life's there. The Holy Spirit's in you. The buds there. But the Lord's saying, I want to see the apples ripen and holiness in your life. I want to see your holy tree in full bloom. 
They don't grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And another thing that many people, because we, we settle in this halfway house in Haran and we, we, we're in danger of dying there, many people never get to actually understand their spiritual gift. That's fatal. It's not good for you and it's not good for others around you if you don't find your gift and begin to use it. Maybe they never seek the gift. Maybe they never fan into flame the gift that's in them and stir it up like Paul commands Timothy to do. Um, you've got a gift. It will be to your benefit to use it. It will be to other people's benefit that you use it. It will be to God's glory that you use it. The kingdom will advance and be strengthened if you use your gift. And if you don't do it, you're going to die in Haran. You're going to wither. You're going to fail. It's not going to be good. You don't get the joy of seeing God use you in powerful, positive ways. Because we settle. And I believe, very simply, this message this morning is just not, there's not ten points. There's just one big point. Don't die in Iran. Don't settle. Don't settle and don't die there. Keep moving with Jesus. There's a way out of Haran experiences. That's the encouraging thing the Lord wants to say. Maybe you're in here today and you're as dry as dust. Your spiritual life is a wilderness. It's really bad. Maybe nobody knows it, but you know it. You're nowhere with God. You know exactly what I'm talking about when you say, I've sat down. I've settled. The journey's not going on with me anymore. Well, I believe the Lord wants to encourage you this morning, brother or sister. There's a way out of Haran experiences. There's a whole story of Abraham after this one. Yeah, Terah dies there, but Abraham doesn't. Abraham, the man of faith and the friend of God, he presses on and he does a journey with God. And boy, does he journey with God through the book. You read him. And I'm encouraged by Abraham. Why? Because he's a man of faith and he's a failure. And I love people who fail in the Bible because I fail. And he, he struggles with the past, he struggles with sin, he struggles with all sorts of things. He struggles with fear. He struggles with believing God's promises. He struggles with doubt. And God all the time has been patient with him and he's teaching him. See, this journey, it's all about learning who God is and who we are. And as you deal with God over time, you learn God's faithful. I can trust him. I don't need to fear. That's why I love Abraham. And God says there's a way out of this experience. If this is you today, I'm telling you, take heart and take hope. And God wants to speak to you. Don't stop on Haran. Don't settle here. And don't settle here spiritually. Don't quench the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life. Whatever he wants you to do, you do it. If he's telling you to serve in the church in a particular way, and you're in rebellion against that, you get out of the rebellion and you just say, Lord, I'll submit to you. I'll serve this way. I don't know what my gifts are, but if you don't start serving, you'll never find out. If you don't start moving out in the world, in the church, use your gifts. Don't allow an attitude like this. The heart that would say to God, I'm not able anymore. The heart that would say to God, I'm not able to advance. The heart that would say, even God can't fix me. I've, I've, I haven't only settled here, I've gone back. I've gone back to where I started. It's not that I've made progress and stopped here. My progress has been regress. I've gone backwards in my spiritual journey. Well, God says, don't take this attitude. Don't take the, the attitude that would say, I'm not hungry for more. I couldn't care less what this preacher's on about. I can't wait to get out of this place. Because you're not hungry. You're not hungry. And Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's what he says. Ask God to change your appetites and hungers. If this type of a message doesn't tick your box, change the box. Change the question. That's what God's saying this morning. Because listen, don't allow this, I'm not able to advance and, and I'm done for attitude to get, get in. Because Satan will tell you to stop. You've hit a brick wall. Satan will say, stop now. This is pathetic. You've hit a brick wall. You can't go any further. You have to settle here in Haran. But God says, listen to this. God says, I never hit a brick wall. I never hit a brick wall. I never met a mountain I can't move. I never met a sea I can't part. 
I never seen a fire I can't control. I never met a problem my power boys before. I never seen a sin I cannot forgive. I never seen a sinner I can't save. I never seen a life I can't fix. I never seen a wound I can't heal. Do you get it? Satan says there's a brick wall. You can't change. You're no good for God. And God says different. I don't know about brick walls, says the Lord. See, do you want, listen, trying to encourage some appetite in us all. Don't you want to see what God will do in your life if you just keep going? Do you not want to see, I wonder what God will do with me if I take this Bible seriously? I wonder what God would do, what amazing things he could do with me if I believe this stuff. If I keep going, keep growing, keep sowing, keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking, keep serving, keep worshipping, keep on keeping on. I wonder what God's going to do with me. He'll do something. He'll use you. He will. I can't, I can't fail. God can't fail. Never settle for Satan's second best is where I want to drive this to a close this morning. The easy way is often the wrong way in your life. It's easy to settle. The old idols are familiar. It's nice, but it's wrong. It's the wrong path. And I say this, don't you want to journey further with Jesus? Don't you want to journey deeper with Jesus? Do you not want that? I know that the Holy Spirit in you, if you're a Christian, is agreeing with me. Your flesh might not be, but the Holy Spirit in you is crying out, yes, that's what you want. You want to go deeper with Jesus. You don't want to settle, you want to advance Christian. That's what he's saying to you this morning. Too many churches and Christians have simply settled down and are waiting to die in Haran. <laughs> we'll just stick it out. We'll just, we'll just stick it out. God doesn't want you to stick it out. God wants you to advance and grow. And that's not God's plan for you. His plan is to finish the work, complete the journey, change you day by day from one degree of glory to another, and I had an image as I was writing this. You see, God would say to you, know what you're like, Christian? You're like a, a piece of clay in the potter's hand. That's the image that was coming to me. And I'm working in your life through the, the hard times and the trials. I'm using it for good. God works all things together for good for those who love him, by the way. Even in the difficult times when you think nothing's happening, God's working to make you more beautiful, more like Jesus. That's what's happening. And you're like a piece of clay in the potter's hands every day. And the potter's saying, go this way. Go this way. Do this now. Don't think that. And Satan's saying, no. The flesh is saying, no. And the world is saying, no. But God's saying, yes. And the Holy Spirit wants to say to you today, allow me to mold you into a beautiful vessel fit for the master's use. Day by day. We don't have a day to, to, to waste. We don't have a week to waste. When you read the Bible, you'll start to see words like this come up. About progress and about bearing fruit and about being transformed. And, and especially in Thessalonians, and I think it's First Thessalonians in particular, where the word more and more comes up, more and more love, more and more abounding in these things. The motto of the Christian is more and more. That's what I want to say. More and more, Lord. More and more. That's the motto of the Christian. More and more love. More and more knowledge of God through the word. More and more prayer. More and more grace. More and more power. More character. More souls saved, Lord, please. More people saved. More faithfulness in my life. To turn up even when I don't want to. To do the thing that I don't want to do. To be faithful. Faithfulness. More and more joy in my life, Lord. More peace. More kindness. Less of the old sinner that I was. Horrible. Sin is horrible. I hate sin, but not as much as I should. I'm growing to hate it more, but not as much as I should. And I pray that I'll hate it even more tomorrow. We all visit Haran at times. We stop. But God says the choice is ours. And we must stand up today as I close and say, I'm not staying here. If you're there this morning, make a decision. 
by the power of the Spirit and say, I'm not staying in this spiritual desert. I'm not dying here in Haran. I'm living with Jesus. I'm not dying in Haran. I'm going to live with Jesus. And the pushback will be, but Mark, you don't understand. I'm weary. I'm weary, Mark. I hear what you're saying. I understand what you're saying, but I'm weary. I don't know if I can take another step. The word says, be encouraged. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That's what the word says. Paul put it like this. When he talked about his ministry, he said, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. That's what Paul thought about his ministry. It's not my strength, it's God's strength. And if you're going on your strength, you will feel weary. You've got to do what David did and encourage yourself in the Lord. Draw from him. What does that mean? You learn it for yourself. You're a disciple of Jesus. You're his sheep. He's your shepherd. If you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you and you'll find out how God can strengthen you. I can't draw a diagram or anything like that for you. You must encounter him for yourself. It's a personal journey with Jesus that you've got. But Paul says, I work with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. There's energy available for you. I'm weary, Mark. I can't go on. I don't think that this journey is for me. I have to stop. No, you don't. He gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. I said this. If serving him and holiness is your destination, God has the petrol and the fuel to get you there. If holiness is your destination, if serving God is where you're going, God has the petrol to bring you there. He does. He has the power. He has the strength to bring you to where you're going. I want to speak, I always like to preach the gospel. I want to speak to unbelievers, maybe who are watching this online, maybe you're in this room, I don't know. But what happened to Terah was this. Maybe what happened to him was he set out on a journey and he says, I'll get there one day. I'm going to Canaan. And he had good intentions, but somewhere along the line of going to where he needed to be, he got diverted and stopped. That's what happens to many unbelievers. People who hear the gospel and they go, They've heard enough of the gospel to know it's true, but they haven't responded. They haven't got over the line. I'll get there one day. I believe it, but I haven't received it. I believe Jesus, but I haven't received Jesus. You're not saved. And good intentions don't save. And what I want to encourage people is, don't die in Haran if you're an unbeliever who's got an intention of going to Jesus one day. I'll get saved one day. One day, I'll go to Jesus. I have a plan that, you know, in 10 years, I'm going to do my business I'm going to do my thing, I'm going to live my life, and I know I need Jesus, I know I need to repent, I know that there's a heaven and a hell, and I intend one day to get to Jesus. You're in danger of dying in Haran. You're in danger of never getting there. Terah died in Haran. He didn't get around to it. He didn't get out of it. Do you intend to be saved? What if you never get around to it? You intend to go to Jesus one day, but what if the old idols has such a grip on you that you never leave that time? The Bible says now is the day of salvation. On the cross, Jesus died for all your sins in your place. As your substitute. And he calls you. He doesn't say. The Bible never says. Uh, Think about it and come back tomorrow. And let me know what you're going to do here. The gospel calls always urgent. And right now. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't settle in a halfway house. No one is true. Never receiving Jesus. He's your substitute. He's your saviour. But you must receive him. There's something you have to do. You have to repent and trust him. You have to do that. Don't die in Haran like Tara. Make it on through. Push your way on through to Christ. Christ told the parable. Stupid uh, people invited to a banquet. Uh, I, I've just got married. I've just bought a farm. I've got other stuff to do. Thanks for the invite, but no thanks. And life creeps in. And the old idols has a strong grip on people. 
Jesus says, come to the banquet. The king's calling you. Don't die in Haran. Come to Jesus. Trust him and what he has done for you on the cross. He loves you. He's calling for you. There's nothing hindering you. Only your own decision to say no. Come to Christ today if you're not saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for each person in here and watching online. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will take it and plant it in our hearts. Let it be a word that stays with us, lingers in our mind, does the work that you send it to do, Lord. Let the word go to work in us. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit in us. Lord, do something in us this morning, something we didn't expect. Give us the power. Lord, maybe there's people in here who are weak. Lord, your word says you give strength and power to the weak. Maybe there's people in here who thought, I've hit a brick wall. I can't go on. Lord, remind them what you said there earlier. I believe it's your heart in this room that you never hit a brick wall. You never meet a mountain you can't move. You've never met a sea that you can't part. You've never met a problem that your power can't help. You've never met a sin that you can't forgive or a sinner that you can't save. Lord, help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.